Welcome to another presentation where we're looking at education as it moves into the future and we're basing all this around evidence. What does the evidence from research tell us that can guide us as we move into the future? This is the final presentation in this series and the theme of this one is what does research reveal about educational delusions and confusions? And there's a lot of these. The educational world. There are lots of areas where there are confusions. People are not sure. There's lots of areas where there are delusions. People work in what they want it to be. The best word is perhaps that word there, myths. If you do a, an internet trawl on myths in education, you come up with a lot of hits and you come up with contributions from some very eminent researchers, which shows that there are many things that we do and believe that are not supported by the evidence. So this presentation is looking at a few of these, just a few of them, and asks, what does the evidence show? The first area we are going to look at is the world of constructivism. It's often stated or implied that it holds the key to good teaching. And you very often find in books statements like learners construct knowledge. What does the evidence actually show? There's little support for these assertions. The key rests in that. Learners do not construct un knowledge, they construct understanding. The knowledge is there whether we know it or understand it. We, construct, we try to construct understanding, we're trying to make sense of things. The word knowledge is used far too loosely in education writing. It leaves us confused. Here's a simple way I've tried to clarify it. Learning. The process by which we gain understanding. It's a natural process in life, in all areas of life. If you look at understanding, I look at it the other way around. Understanding is the product or the result of the learning process. doesn't follow that we'll get understandings right every time. But learning and understanding are inextricably linked. And in the process of learning, we're constructing our understandings. We're trying to make sense of the world around. The world that includes the world of relationships. The physical world, the biological world, the mental world, the world of events. We're making sense of the world around. And we construct our own understandings of that world. The evidence supporting that is overwhelming. Now essentially we do it individually but there's a sense also in which we're involved in it socially. You see our understanding, your understanding, your understanding of this presentation is being constructed by you at the moment in your mind and it's individual to you. You may or may not be understanding it the way I hope you're understanding it and I will never know. The teacher will never know unless they can probe inside the mind by lots of questioning with an individual student. But of course there's a constructing socially. We share our understandings and that helps us to develop some kind of agreed understanding. So important in making life possible and sociable. But the understanding goes on in your mind. We share it and that influences your understanding and my understanding and we get towards some kind of agreed understanding, perhaps. So constructivism, as a paradigm of learning, the evidence supports that overwhelmingly. 
were all in the business of trying to make sense of the world around. As a paradigm of teaching, we're going down the wrong track. You see, each of us understands, constructs our understandings idiosyncratically. We do it in our own way, by our own logic, in our own minds, on our own. Now, of course, we can share it with others. And that may help us to bring our understandings into line with more accepted understandings, perhaps. So constructivism in teaching, you talk about the constructivist teacher, that's a logical absurdity at one level. Constructivism is going to go on all the time. It's the way we learn. We construct our understandings. Doesn't matter what the teacher does. But where the teacher can help is by giving opportunities for us to share our understandings. And it helps our understandings to come more into line with the understandings that are more widely accepted. We've got to be very careful. There's so much loose talk. Underpinning this is a powerfully important idea. But the way it's presented can often lead us off in the wrong direction. Let's move on to the next one. That's very common across society. Got 51%. Oh, that's good. You passed. Got 49%. What a pity. You failed. Do marks have meaning? If we think they've got meaning, then we compare marks between successive year groups in a school, for example. If you think marks have got meaning, then you can say, well, you've got to get 75% to get a grade A, 50% to get a pass. What does the evidence show? No evidence to support any of these. Marks on their own have no meaning. If you've got a class, all sat in examination, you get a set of marks. All the marks have done is put that group of students in an approximate order of merit on the basis of that one examination sat in one day in one set of circumstances. And of course, an individual student might have a good day or a bad day, or the paper might suit them or not suit them. Marks on their own have no meaning. You have no idea the difficulty level of any examination. You cannot determine it objectively. It's not possible. Now, let me take you through an imagin imaginary situation. Suppose you've got 10,000 candidates and they sit in examination in one subject each year. The sort of thing that examination boards in countries will face all the time. Now, with that big number, if there are no changes in policy, the same proportion of students should pass each year from 10,000. The laws of probability determine that. It's going to happen. And the same proportions should also grade, get the grades A, B, C and so on. The laws of probability, you can't contradict them. It predicts it will happen. Many examination boards know that and in very sensible ways they direct their computer to arrange that this happens. So that if 70% of the candidates in this subject passed last year, the computer is told set the pass mark so that 70% pass this year. Now you can't divide the pass mark into fractions of a mark so it may not come out to be exactly 70 but it might be 69.9 or 70.1 which may be the nearest to the 70. But the, the pass percentage is going to hover around the 70 every year if that's the policy decision. That's got huge advantages. <clears throat> you see, the demand level examination papers may vary slightly from year to year. 
I've known cases where it can vary quite a lot. But this keeps the standard of a pass about the same each year. It's fair to the students. It means if you get an A, it's the same every year. But listen to politicians. Listen to the media outlets. And sadly, listen to some educationalists. Many of the comments made are just ill-informed. The examination board has taken positive policy decisions that are based on sound evidence and comments from outsiders are simply ill-informed. But what about a school? Supposing you've got a hundred candidates, that's quite a big number for a school, sitting an examination each year in a school. The number that pass each year won't be the same. Again, the laws of probability kick in. You're going to get the random variations from year to year. That's inevitable. You can't predict it and the examination paper won't tell you. Similarly, the same number one grain grades A, B and C. The laws of probability inevitably determine there will be variations. Good years, bad years. Teachers know this. They can look, and they're usually with unerring accuracy. They say, we're going to get good results with this year group. It's a good year group. But wait till next year. That year group is nowhere near as good. They won't get such good grades. Now, with the laws of probability kicking in with the examination board over a much larger number of candidates, that's all allowed for. One study showed a variation from year to year over I think a 14 year period that went up and down as high as plus or minus 30 percent. No change in the school intake or population or policies. It was just a random effect of probability. A kind of medium sized school. You're going to get that. It's inevitable. So if an inspector comes and says, oh, your exam results this year weren't as good as last year. Something's gone wrong. They're talking complete nonsense. That's just the laws of probability. You can't judge a school by its examination results. From one year, not even three years. Probability will determine the randomness of them. You maybe could determine if you looked at 10 years, but that does that help the school because teachers have changed over that 10 year period. This is a nonsense which goes on. And again, I come back to this. Most comments by most politicians, most media outlets, and sadly, most school inspectors are simply ill-informed. They should all do a course on the simple laws of probability. But we don't have to understand the fullness of probability. Simple logic will tell you that. Or just listen to teachers. They know there are good years and bad years. It just requires one year to have a small group of students who are very good. They lift the whole standard across the year group. Doesn't happen every year, sadly. That's just the laws of probability. It's going to happen. Marks mean almost nothing. I've heard that said frequently. Got to stop the teacher standing at the front. Let the students do student-centred learning. Working on their own or in groups. That gets you better understanding. Now, by student-centred learning, I put up four types. Not the only four, but these are the common ones that you'll find across the literature. Problem-based, discovery, inquiry-based, or just group work as a general statement. Many studies on these. Do these lead to better understanding? What does the research evidence actually show?
There is no evidence to support this assertion. But you may come up and with one study that shows that, let's say, problem-based learning gives you better understanding. Then I can come up with another paper that will show the opposite. As one person who's looked at this from a psychological perspective showed, for every paper where it shows any of these are better, you can find one that shows it's worse when it comes to understanding. Because that's the principle. The teaching strategy is not the key to determine the extent of understanding. Just look at that, let it ring through your mind. The teaching strategy is not the key to determine the extent of understanding. It's how you use the strategy that holds the key, not the strategy itself. We'll follow it up in a minute. Now there are enormous benefits of problem-based learning, discovery learning, inquiry-based learning and group work for other skills. But when it comes to understanding, they have no universal advantage. It depends on the way they're used. That sort of view paper. Let the title and the subtitle just go through your mind. Why minimal guidance during instruction does not work. An analysis of the failure of constructivist discovery, problem-based, experiential, inquiry-based learning. Top journal, three eminent leaders in the world in their field. Reviewing the evidence. They're not saying that constructivism in the sense of constructing understanding or discovery or any other types of learning are bad. They've got enormous value. But they don't hold the key when it comes to understanding. And the review shows what does hold the key. You see, these are all dis reflecting teaching strategies. Constructivism describes how understanding always takes place, no matter what we do. Back to the principle. The teaching strategy does not hold the key to extent of understanding. It's how you use the teaching strategy that's the key. Because that's the key to understanding. Understanding can only take place in the working memory part of the human brain. It's got a fixed and limited capacity. If it overloads, understanding is a casualty. So teaching in line with the limitations of working memory, no matter what strategy you use, you'll get good understanding. So I could summarize it that way. If any teaching strategy works within the limitations of working memory capacity, then the extent of understanding is likely to be high. That's the key. And there are hundreds of papers that show that. I've heard people arguing strongly. Quantitative is the only way to go. Others say, I only use qualitative methods. There's no place for quantitative and educational research. Other people are trying to justify mixing them. And people hold very strong views. Where lies the truth? What does the evidence show? You could summarize it that way. The arguments are totally pointless. They're futile. Waste of time. You choose your research approach to obtain the greatest insights. And if that means going quantitative, you go quantitative. If it means going qualitative, you go qualitative. If it means mixing them, you mix them. There's no right or wrong. They all have a place. 
and the dogmatism is utterly misplaced. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Some examples, not a complete list, but some examples. Quantitative work can start by just getting the marks from examinations, for example. Many standardized tests, very useful, give us lots of insights. Or you can get the researcher devising their own test of something. All kinds of quantitative measures, the number of questions asked in per hour in a given lesson approach, some very clever methods in the literature where people have got at things simply by counting the occurrence of certain events because they're an indicator of something much deeper. Or in questionnaires you've got the frequencies of responses. If you look at the qualitative side, you've got interviews where usually one-to-one, -one, either very structured with a series of fixed questions or very open what do you think about or what your comments on, or somewhere in between is more common. Focus groups, <clears throat> useful with a small group of students, talk to them, listen to them, discuss with them on some issue. You can observe things, observing patterns of behaviour. You can describe what's going on, that's qualitative. Or you can look at the documents that are underpinning an educational policy, for example, and its implementation, and tie that into other measurements. Here are just some of the um, examples of quantitative and qualitative. But you see, you can combine these in any way and in any proportions. Now there are some people who say that. Oh, learning is such a complex business. You can't reduce it to numbers. That's unhelpful. I've listened to these people and then I've looked at them and I found out that it's just justifying the fact that they're uncomfortable with numbers, uncomfortable with statistics. They're just hiding their own weakness in many cases. But that statement is a nonsense complete nonsense. Let's just stop for a minute and look at medicine. A human body is a very complicated thing and yet medical research makes measurements with numbers all over the place. It helps us, develops new insights, develops new drug treatments, new procedures and it helps you and me in making our lifestyles good. It's just a nonsense. But there are some who think of qualitative meaning focus groups and interviews where quantitative is questionnaires. And they don't seem to know any other approaches at all. And that's very, very common. Just look at research projects, look at PhDs, look at papers published, conference presentations. Now, if you look at questionnaires, focus groups and interviews, all they're doing is collating the opinions of people. Do we base our evidence and education on opinions? That's not a sensible way to go on. This is far too limiting. There are far too many questionnaires, focus groups and interviews. We need some much tighter evidence because these are just collations of opinions. The opinions may be honestly held, but they may not be right. And indeed, they may not even see the whole picture. That's the world of statistics. They're uncomfortable statistics. Don't reject the quantitative. Find somebody who can help you with statistics. There are people who love doing it. That's the world of objective collation. You've got to bring together the qualitative evidence. Now that poses a problem. There are those who say, but you've got to use a computer program to bring it together. And there are some good computer programs that will do it. Because we're all biased. And the computer program will make it objective and remove the bias. No, it doesn't. I've looked at some of these. 
you've got to set the program up the way you want it and that brings in the subjective and anyway are we all that biased many of the things we're looking at we don't hold any strong view we're coming to it quite objectively anyway if you're aware that there's a potential of bias you can get around it and if you're in doubt you get a good friend that you can trust to look and comment to make sure you're not putting a bias on it we can collate the evidence by all kinds of ways that are just convenient and helpful and that give good pictures we need both it's not an either or and we need both and we mix them as we need them because we're not asking the right question by looking at the method we're saying what will give us the best insights into what we're pursuing that's the real question you can summarize it that way if it's quantitative you use it if it's qualitative you use it if it's a bit of both you use it and then you say can I get the information by this method sometimes in practice it may be very difficult there are practical constraints of time and money sometimes it's useful to carry out a small trial run that's just to see if it works because you don't know if it will work now sometimes that's not necessary sometimes it's not appropriate there's no rule but you see you can combine multiple sources of information to gain richer insights that's true in all life why should education be different but don't use phrases like mixed methods or triangulation or theoretical frameworks that's just jargon signifies nothing it impresses nobody we make ourselves a source of mockery from other disciplines by our use of these strange words you see labeling something doesn't constitute evidence of validity doesn't say it's the right way and labeling something we're making it abstract and that's not the same as erudition that's not high quality academic work listen to a Nobel Prize winner giving us a, a lecture they can communicate the most complex areas in lucid simple terms and straightforward language we should do no less get rid of all this jargon it signifies nothing let's move on to the next one many a PhD project has started with that assumption it basically is saying the teachers are at fault they're not motivating their students and then they think that motivation can be measured by questionnaires that's open to a lot of challenge then they're going to finish off by telling the teachers to increase the motivation that's the answer is it what does the evidence from research actually show I have put it involves a logical fallacy I shall see in a moment it involves an awful lot of logical fallacies not just one <clears throat> those who are motivated tend to perform well those who perform well tend to be motivated they go together it doesn't imply cause and effect correlation as a statistical technique cannot show cause and effect simply shows that two things go together <coughs> height and weight go together they don't cause each other just that bigger people tend to be taller and heavier yes but that's not world shaking I've seen a PhD built around that as if it's some great discovery any teacher knows that <laughs> they know that a motivated class tends to perform well a class that performs well tends to be motivated they go together they don't cause each other not in the direct sense maybe they just feed off each other or maybe they link to something else 
What is known, and psychologists can help us here, is that motivation is highly multivariate. It's not one thing. It's not one variable. <clears throat> and it cannot usefully be measured by questionnaires. I'm saying that quite dogmatically and strongly. And the evidence for that is extremely strong. If it's multivariable, a questionnaire starts to fall apart. And there's strong evidence that shows that learners often report on things as they would like them to be, <clears throat> rather than as they really are. People take the questionnaire and create some sort of scores, usually by wrong statistics, find the correlate with exam marks. Doesn't reveal anything. Any teacher knows that people are motivated to perform better. But the score they get, is that a measure of motivation? It's so imprecise as a measure, it's not very helpful. <coughs> but how can a teacher increase motivation? None of the studies that have pursued that line ever give an answer to that. They just say, teachers should motivate the students more. But how? But there is a way. All of this shows the whole thing is flawed from beginning to end. As so much educational research is. Not thought through carefully. And the evidence not looked at. What does research actually reveal? Just follow this logic through. One or two studies have brought this together, but in general it's derived from many studies that have been collated. If our teaching avoids working memory overload, understanding is enhanced. Because understanding has to take place in the working memory. It's the only part of the brain where it can take place. Working memory's capacity is fixed and finite. If you overload it, you don't get understanding. It's black and white, and the evidence shows it. <clears throat> the evidence shows that seeking to understand is the natural way humans want to learn. It goes right back to the work of Hermann Ebbinghaus in Germany towards the end of the 19th century amplified and exemplified in the brilliant work of Jean Piaget in Paris in the mid-20th century, but confirmed by numerous others. So when you get successful understanding, then we're working in line with the way the humans want to work. So attitudes towards the study develop positively. And a clear evidence to show that from a number of more recent studies. And when you get positive attitudes towards whatever you're doing, it links to increased confidence and positive motivation. You're not turned off. You want to do more. And you feel you will succeed. Because you have succeeded in understanding, because the teacher has enabled it to happen. That's the key. And it's a, logic, a logical progression. And several studies have contributed to understanding that route. Working memory overload is one of the biggest problems in understanding. Get that right, you're on a winner. And it follows through naturally. And you don't need another pointless study using a questionnaire which will show nothing. I've seen that demanded. I've even seen reviewers reject a paper because the reliability wasn't quoted. Usually they're asking for a computed Cronbach's Alpha. Very often the validity of what they're doing is not fully addressed. What does the evidence show about all of this? 
it shows that the whole thing is upside down. Validity is what's important, not reliability. And validity is much more than some so-called experts looking at a questionnaire. Doesn't matter how expert the experts may be, that's not the way to measure validity. That's just opinions. One of the ways to get at it is, <clears throat> try the questionnaire out with a small group and get them to discuss with you, <coughs> either as they're doing it or just afterwards, how they chose the answers they chose. How did they understand the questions? Now that's been done. That gives you evidence of validity. It also shows that very often it's not that valid. But what about Cronbach's Alpha? He devised his statistic as a measure of internal consistency. Read his original paper, I'll put the reference at the end. It's not a test of reliability in the sense of test, retest. What we want in education is to know if we make the measurement today, if we do the same measurement tomorrow, will we get a similar result? That's not what Cronbach's Alpha was ever designed to test. And read his comment written 50 years after the launch of a statistic. <coughs> the reference will be at the end. It's not the right statistic here. Validity is what's important. And if you look at an awful lot of educational research, the validity is certainly questionable. Basically, how do we know we're measuring what we intend? Or more precisely, how do we know that the respondents gain their answers, whether the answers or solving mathematical equations or ticking a questionnaire in the ways that we expect. Are they interpreting it the way we intended? And how do we know the score, whatever that score may be, reflects the value of the intended variable? If you set a mathematics test, <clears throat> then the total score obtained is certainly a measure of mathematical skills, particularly the skills that are obtained in that test. More difficult with some other variables. That's what's important and the evidence shows, and someone has done this, <clears throat> if you take a questionnaire and you apply it in two separate occasions to similar groups, you get similar results. It's not usually a problem, <coughs> provided the samples are big enough and reliability is discussed in one of the references at the end. It's a strange irony, but it's a sad irony. There's so many rules that have been put round about trying to make education research look robust, most of which are nonsense. But we're not paying attention to the single most important feature. Validity. <coughs> That's the key. And coming back to these rules, if you look at it, <clears throat> let's be honest, we're just playing an academic game. But the sad thing is, by forcing our PhD students into that academic game, we're wasting their time. These are very able people. And they're not able to focus on actually doing real research because they're trying to conform to the rules that we've imposed on them. What does the evidence show about some of these?
Most PhD theses lie gathering dust on a shelf somewhere. And it's simply because they rarely find anything either new or useful. <coughs> Such talented people who've worked so hard, we've wasted their time conforming to systems. There are exceptions. And in research centres, and there are a few of them in the world, they don't follow these rules. They do PhD work the same as other subjects do it. Their students publish their work in top quality international journals. Because they are finding out things that are new or useful, or both. The evidence is there. Let's look at some of the patterns and rules that we put up. We insist that they go through courses to teach research skills. Someone has studied that in a research exercise and the evidence is quite clear. You learn your research skills by doing research, not by talking about them or listening to somebody else talk about them. A detailed research pro project proposal. Some countries, they give you six months to do it. That's six months lost for research. But as one academic who is qualified both on his own subject and in education commented, if you require students to write a project proposal the way you ask for it, they know too much. It's not real research. You've closed every option. You can predetermine the answer. You can predict the outcome right from the start. It's a waste of time. It destroys the real nature of research. And then that proposal has to be approved, sometimes by an individual or by a team of academics. How can anyone know enough in every area? Unrealistic. I've seen a research proposal that was devised deliberately by two very experienced research academics. <clears throat> Attached to the student, who applied to do the PhD and was turned down. The so-called experts didn't understand it. All of these things are a complete waste of time. The research questions close doors. Research paradigms is just playing games. Theoretical framework is just playing games as well. And you take up so much time doing all of this and your proposal that you've only time to do one round of research, one set of measurements. <clears throat> Look at PhDs in education which don't follow the procedures. They usually have about three sets of measurements. They find out something useful, meaningful, helpful, and it's worth publishing. And it nearly always is published in top international journals. And this long methodology chapter. Look at them. I must have read about a hundred or two of these in marking PhDs. They just repeat each other or some book. They're usually saying things that are self-evidently obvious. It's a waste of space and it's a waste of student effort. Let's do the research. Not all of this waste of time repeating things that are unimportant. And some people insist that the discussion is separated from the data. Even some journals do that. Doesn't help the reader. Looking at reading the discussion section, you've got to keep referring back maybe to tables of data in the data section to make sense of it. Weave them together. Think of the reader. Think of usefulness. And some countries insist on a section on recommendations that come from the PhD findings. These are usually the bright ideas of the student and some of them are very clever. They're never read by anybody and many of them can't be implemented because they've got resource implications. And the people who hold the resources will never see them. And the oral I've seen horrendous things come out of that. I've seen an oral where the examiner insisted that his favourite author had to be included and discussed, simply because he was his favourite author. I've seen an oral, heard of orals, where the entire examining time was spent discussing the literature chapters, never discussed the experimental data that was gained. I've seen another one which insisted on the number of references being reduced amazingly, but failed to see that the statistics were incorrect. The oral is there for a simple purpose. The examiners don't know if the student did the work themselves 
unaided. And they don't know if the student understands what they've written. Someone could have helped them. It's just to check that. The thesis stands or falls in its own right. We've got to rethink the oral. It's not a qu question here of point scoring by examiners or getting in their favourite author. What's the evidence that we're going the wrong way? Is it just my opinion? Shared by many, but what's the evidence? I think that's the strongest evidence, but it's only one strand. When the procedures that PhDs follow do not follow these patterns in education, we end up with research that leads to papers published in international journals. Go to the libraries that hold theses, which happens in the West. See which theses are downloaded most frequently. That gives interesting insights. But there's another piece of evidence, and it's a sad piece. Over the years I've had PhD students come to me on the quiet, often connected to me by another PhD student or a postdoctoral student who happens to know me, seeking advice and help. Some of them are in tears, in utter frustration about what they're being forced to do. That's no way to treat people. These are very able, very committed, very talented young people who've got so much to offer. Let's release that talent and let's give them a satisfying, fulfilling experience, but one that gives the real possibility of getting something published where other people can read it. There is strong evidence that we've got things badly wrong. Research means that. How can you write a research proposal when you don't know what you're going to meet? Or even if what you're going to try and measure will work? You can't predict it. And if you put down research questions, it ties your hands. I've seen a PhD thesis, PhD study, where something turned up that was utterly unpredicted. It led to a change of direction and a completely new chapter being added to the thesis. Probably the most important, interesting thing that the research uncovered. You can't predict that. We're not just trying to describe what's going on. We're looking at why, because if we understand why things work in certain ways, then we can predict how we can make it different. Because we're trying to bring benefit to future learners. We're trying to take education forward. That's real research. Let's revamp things that way. Let's look at it in the broad sense now. That happens to be true. Doesn't matter whether you're doing your PhD in archaeology, engineering, medicine, physics. If only we learn from the way they do it. As a result, and many people have observed that, teachers don't read research papers, policy makers certainly don't, they're never influenced by them, I'm not surprised. Most of what goes on never gets beyond that. Doesn't generate anything that's going to lead to meaningful changes. And I pictured the sad picture of these very able young people from many countries. I've even had people travel just to talk to me. Utterly frustrated. We've got a problem. I have listened to people justifying unjustifiable practices. Oh, it saddens me. Where is the evidence they don't bring up. They just insist. Now we want to make our research look rigorous, but we make our research look rigorous by being rigorous, and that's when it makes an impact. 
You see, we're losing the real nature of research and education. We've got to put our house in order, big time. And we've got to rethink things. And it could be done wonderfully. That's where we start. We can learn so much from each other. And let's get the links to teachers. The research that's not related to the real things that go on in classrooms, teaching areas and schools and universities, we've lost touch with reality. And we've got to bring education research back in touch with the things that teachers actually teach. They're employed as a teacher of history, chemistry, whatever. They're committed to it. They're committed to their students. Let's get it back into these areas. And let's start looking at the why questions, not endless descriptions. Why do things work this way? Why does this not work? Why are the students finding problems? And we've got to throw out a certain opinion. If you look at this, there's far too much questionnaire work. They just gather opinions. That's no way to take research forward. Let's get back to replicated evidence. Now there's wonderful work out there. It is a minority. There are PhDs that do work in line with the way other subjects do it. They are generating powerful insights for the future. Some of them have been cited in this series. But let's get back to it. That's our agenda. Quite a lot of papers here. you see Cronbach's two papers. This is a very small snatch of some of the papers that do exist. In some ways it's worthwhile looking at one second from the bottom because you can get it online. An eminent figure. But it points to all sorts of other sources. Some useful writers mayor has got some powerful insights that are rigorously developed. We need to pay attention to what the evidence actually says. Let's move educational research forward to an exciting future, to bring benefit to future learners all over the world. I wish you well.